The recent developments in artificial intelligence have many smart people say that AI is going to take over the world. The truth is that the Torah and the sages have discussed the AI mindset for many generations and how it destroys lives and relationships. What's the AI mindset, you say? The AI mindset is a lethal weapon of the Satan that could very well put you in a situation without you realizing it until it's too late. Once you uncover what this is, you'll know exactly where you stand. You're also going to know the significant difference between Jews and Gentiles and what's possible and what could be taken away from a person that doesn't appreciate what was gifted to them. All of this is going to be discussed in tonight's lecture, the Yigeret HaKodesh, Jewish intimacy, and ultimately our connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and our journey to be holy. We're back here on our Jewish Ashkafa, our uh, Jewish intimacy series, uh, where uh, the uh, Igeret Amban, uh, the Igeret Hakodesh. Apparently, I'm confused. Igeret Hakodesh of the um, of the Ramban is uh, guiding us to uh, really rethink, rethink intimacy, rethink Judaism rethink life uh, all together uh, over the last several months that we've been studying this together, Baruch Hashem. And uh, tonight, uh, like every one of the other uh, previous lectures uh, in this series, uh, it's going to certainly uh, make us think again, make us think again and uh, make us think uh, about uh, what our mindset is like and uh, what uh, our intimacy is like in comparing the two but we're going to delve into the world of AI. AI is uh, certainly a place that uh, many people are talking about, a subject that many people are talking about. But before we get started, let's make sure to uh, uh, remind uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu that uh, we are aware, not uh, that he needs to be reminded, but uh, that we are aware that uh, you know, we need his help. We need his help. We need his prayers. We need his mercy. Or we need our prayers. We need his mercy. Uh, and um, for our dear friends and family that are not doing well, uh, health-wise and, uh, and otherwise, so Bezot Hashem, this uh, shiur will be for the Refua Shlema for Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, uh, Rabbanit Levana Bat uh, Sarah, um, Avi Mori David Ben Esriya, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora, and uh, also for uh, Sarah, Bat, Esther. HaKadosh Baruch will give each one of them and all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahides a refuah uh, shlema, refuah nefesh, refuah aguf. So, a uh, reminder to everybody that wants to uh, donate. Uh, the, uh, some people ask me questions in regards to donations. I'm going to try to answer this once and for all. Uh, donations, if you're donating to the organization, uh, the best place to donate, if you're not going to, you could send a check. That's uh, the address is on our website. You could donate on the uh, websites. We have multiple websites. Bezratashem.org is the main website. Then we also have bhtorah.org. Uh, you could donate over there as well. If you're donating for the sake of tikkun abrit, uh, you know the uh, the sin of immorality, and you want to try to uh, clean up the past. Uh, so long as you're doing tshuva, otherwise, don't donate and continue sinning on purpose, thinking that the donations is going to make your sins okay. If you've done tshuva, you follow the four-step process that I uh, have discussed and have sent to countless people over the years, which is to uh, watch the movie, then watch the uh, you know short clip that talks about tshuva, then uh, go into the uh, you know uh, rest of the uh, playlist of Tikkun Abrit and uh, build yourself some knowledge, which is in essence building yourself a fence, a spiritual fence, so you don't continue sinning, at least not as much as the past and eventually nothing at all. And Bezad Hashem, uh, fix all of the past. This includes men and women, whether a person is promiscuous with self or promiscuous with others, whether it's promiscuous with Jews or non-Jews. Everyone that has these uh, issues, uh, which is the vast majority of the world population, uh, in, uh, you know, has to obviously uh, do tshuva for it. 
if you have the financial ability to uh, do even more than just the typical uh, just stopping the sin, then donations are certainly a help. And the explanation of all of that is on the uh, website tikkunabrit.live. Over there you could also donate as well as read what's on the site uh, that, uh, you know, that could help you understand why even donate for the sake of a certain sin. We are obviously not Christianity or Catholicism or any other form of idolatry, uh, but uh, this uh, donations certainly do help uh, rectify some of the past sins where a traditional uh, tshuva can't do the same thing uh, in the same fashion. Uh, one of the reasons is because there is stopping the sin, there is saying I'm sorry for the sin, but there's also, the Kabbalists teach us, there's also upper heavens, upper heavens where there's still a damage. And to clean up what's there uh, requires a tikkun, and the Arizal uh, educated us about it where he told us that each time a person sins, for example, with wasting seed, he has to fast 84 times. If he was uh, um, promiscuous in, a, in an act of abomination, uh, in, meaning uh, uh, homosexuality, then it's over 300 fasts. If it's a, uh, uh, you know, with a woman that nida, I believe it's 82 fast, if my memory serves me right. Uh, but it also, if it's with a, uh, uh, a non-Jew, then it obviously uh, also, or it's with a nida, and it's not for the sake of uh, bringing a child to the world, uh, you know, then it, it's multiple, meaning it's the nida, it's the wasting seed part, it's multiple fast. Point being is, it's so much fasts for even a single sin that the average human being simply cannot even fathom uh, that many uh, uh, fasts. And therefore, came the Ben Ishchai and explained to us that uh, alongside other sages like the Tanya and others, uh, that uh, explained that you could actually replace those fasts with a uh, one fast and uh, fix the rest of it with money. An explanation of all of this is on the site tikunabrit.live. Now, for those of you that want to donate to me personally, uh, then that is a personal donation. That's not to the organization. That you could send via Zelle or Venmo or send a check or whatever you want to do. Uh, I don't generally publicize that, but since I got already a couple of text messages in the last uh, 24 hours uh, for people that want to donate to me personally, uh, you could donate to me personally that way. Uh, what that's that. Okay, so let's go into the more important part, which is the Torah, the Holy Torah, Baruch Hashem. That's our money. That's our uh, uh, eternity. That's our life. And that is our guide to uh, understand how, uh, where we stand, where we stand, how we're, how we're doing, and uh, really ask the question, which is a little bit a, uh, an intentionally clickbaitish, is AI, meaning artificial intelligence, the AI mindset is the AI mindset taking over your marriage. Now, of course, unless you've been sleeping under a rock, AI has been the number one subject, uh, you know, across the board of all media and all forms of media uh, over the last uh, year or so. Uh, certainly, it's been discussed for, for many, many years, but uh, in the last year since uh, a company named OpenAI came out with a uh, chat G uh, GPT, and then uh, thereafter Google came out with it, and other companies came out with it, and now we see that AI is literally everywhere. Artificial intelligence is used everywhere. Certainly people that uh, have watched, uh, you know, uh, movies, uh, sci-fi movies have, uh, you know, have always, uh, you know, th uh, known of this ultimate fear of one day the robots, the computers are going to take over the world, whether it's the Terminator movies or the old movie from the 1980s of some computer taking over some building. All of these, uh, you know, fictional movies, uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, these movies obviously gave people a certain mindset and many people have this belief that AI is going to take over the world. Now, aside from that being simply stupid, uh, you know, we're not going to delve too much into that. Uh, but I can tell you that an AI mindset is already taking over a part of the world, but not the world that people think. 
rather the bedrooms as one of the key parts that the mindset of the AI, the AI mindset is already taking over and has been taken over uh, for, for many people their whole lives without even their knowledge. Now, what people think in regards to AI taking over the world is simply what they saw in movies. And uh, the reason why I say this is stupid, even though there are many smart people uh, that say it's possible, is simply because it's not written in the Torah. And to Jewish people that follow the Torah, if it's not written in the Torah, it does not exist. Okay? That's the reality. So they can say as much as they want to say. They can think as much as they want to think. They can write very clever articles and do fantastic interviews with 4K and 8K type of uh, uh, cameras. Nothing is going to help change the truth. If it's not written in the Torah, it does not exist. So those that think that the computers... The AI programs are somehow going to uh, take over the world. You, unfortunately, are still poisoned by the movies that you've watched and the video games that you've played. Uh, and I would highly recommend that you uh, replace all of that with Torah and eventually your mindset will be cleaned, which is the subject at hand today. But at the same token, the AI mindset, or the AI mind, I should say, uh, has been taken over many parts of life uh, when it comes to the servitude of Hashem, uh, and primarily in the in the bedroom, in the bedroom itself, when a man is with his wife, how so? You see, when a person thinks of an AI, if you've used Chat GPT, you see a brilliant program, a program that, in so many words, does the thinking for you many times better than you. You could. Uh, educate the program how to think, telling, giving it certain prompts and tell it what to do and how to do it and tell it that you want it to uh, be a, uh, a scholar in, in, uh, in, in some type of field, in science, in physics, in uh, uh, mathematics, uh, even in Torah. Uh, and uh, you can tell it to think like a scholar and therefore respond to your questions or translations or whatever you have in a certain form. And this program... Uh, which requires training, but over a period of time, will literally bring uh, outcomes uh, so fast and many times better than what you could do yourself. Uh, I, I heard uh, there was this, uh, you know, this guy that's a uh, part of the, uh, you know, whatever, let's just, doesn't really make a difference who he is. But anyway, he's a guy, he, he's a rabbi. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he's not very clever. He's not a very smart guy. Let's just say that. Uh, and since you guys don't know who he is, so it doesn't really make a difference what I say uh, about him as far as smart or not smart. It's not Lashon uh, But the point is, he's, not, he's, he's, he's clearly to anyone that you know, uh, sees him, views him, talks to him, he's not a smart guy. Uh, not everybody is the sharpest tool in the, in the shed. Uh, and um, this guy, uh, he can't put you know, two sentences together without you know, uh, fumbling one way or another. Uh, much more than what I'm fumbling today so far. Uh, but I'm not talking about as far as he's fumbling the words and he's uh, trying to get his thought across. He just doesn't know how to think. Now, this guy uh, says that he has become an author in the last several weeks. But not because he has thought of some clever things to write, not because he suddenly learned the skill of writing, but rather because he discovered you know, a uh, chat GPT, discovered AI, and in so many words, he tells the program to write an idea about such and such, and the program writes it, and he just simply copies and pastes. I don't know if he edits it at all, but in so many words, he takes the AI, uh, takes whatever request he has, he writes, let's say, five to ten words of what he wants, the AI gives him a paragraph, or ten paragraphs, or whatever it is, and he's copying and pasting it, and little by little, he put together a book, and this book apparently is going to be sold to the public. I do not doubt for a half a second that he is the only one that's doing it. There are certainly many other people doing it. Some people, for good reasons, uh, they, they should do it because they, their thoughts are simply uh, not good enough uh, for, uh, for, you know, to be... Uh, uh, put on paper, so they need some help from a computer. Uh, others, uh, because of different reasons, perhaps it's a simply a, uh, uh, their. Uh, let's just say, let's just move on with that. Anyway, the uh, the guy became an author. 
Now, if the thoughts are good, it's good. If the thoughts are bad, obviously it's bad regardless of whether it's AI or it's a computer or it's a, uh, a person. But the point being is, is that one thing that, you know, you see with AI, whether it's AI uh, that's a, uh, you know, for, for text like ChatGPT or it's AI that is for different levels of, uh, of, of uh, uh, computing, uh, you know, to turn a uh, text into an image or to turn uh, the, uh, you know, certain uh, images into text or it's a uh, translations and a million and a half other things that they literally are coming out with on a daily basis. Many of these programs are extremely useful. Many of these programs are uh, very effective, some better than others. But the common denominator that you see with all of them is that the machine doesn't ask any questions, usually. Rather, it gives you results. You ask it to do something, and it gives results. Now, Although that sounds perfect, some people even prefer their relationships to be that way. They, you know, they would love that as soon as they ask their, uh, their spouse to do something, they just simply do it without asking any questions. And I certainly would love to have that with my employees uh, or students or friends or anybody where I simply say something and they listen to it. But in reality, it's quite the opposite in many cases because that's human nature. And in essence, that's the difference between human nature and AI. Uh, at least the first uh, difference between the two, where humans ask questions. Why do I need to do this? Uh, how do I need to do this? Are you sure you want this? Can I do this a different way? The AI doesn't do that. The AI simply produces, and many times it produces something you didn't want. And only after prompting it multiple times and fixing it and training it, do you have even a remote chance of getting exactly what you wanted. Now, sometimes you can get much more than you wanted. Like I said, there are uh, uh, certain times where you could actually get better results from the machine than you would get yourself. But the point being is that that, is usually, that usually doesn't happen on the first shot. It doesn't usually happen on the first shot, especially if you've thought out this idea that you're asking the program to do for you uh, and you have something specific in your mind that you want. Usually the program is not going to give you that, at least not exactly what you wanted, and many times not even close to what you wanted. You could ask the program uh, to, let's say, for example, uh, give you a, a picture of, uh, you know, of, of uh, modest people from, uh, from 500 years ago, and it's going to give you, you know, people without fingers and uh, people with a... Uh, uh, all types of clothes. That's not exactly that. So sometimes you have to be a little bit more specific. But the AI doesn't ask you to do that. You have to know that. You have to use your human mind to do that. Now, after you've trained it, you could get better and better results. On the other hand, when it comes to humans... Humans are not necessarily so different at first when they don't know you and they don't know what you want and they don't know how you want it. So usually when you ask somebody to do something, if it's a, an employee, if it's a colleague, and needless to say, if it's a new relationship, it's a new spouse, uh, that person does not know exactly you know, what you want and how you want it, even if you say what you want. But the goal is to not train them, but rather communicate with them. Communicate with them to let them know what you want, how you want, and really the onus is on you to communicate in order to make sure that the relationship works out. Where the you know the main thing that usually causes relationships to fail, uh, and it is certainly all relationships that have trouble, it usually starts with a lack of communication or a miscommunication where they're simply not talking uh, the right way. Uh, they Perhaps they're speaking at each other, but not to each other. They're, uh, they're simply assuming that the other person should know what they want, because apparently, just because they've spent uh, many nights together, they've uh, lived in the same, uh, under the same roof for so many years, they just simply assume that the other person should already know what they want and how they want it, but that just doesn't work that way. Uh, you know, people change, people evolve, and people simply can't read your mind. Now, 
If that was the issue, then really this would turn into some type of shlombite problem. But we're not really talking about just a shlombite problem because this is a deeper rooted issue. This is a new chapter in the Igeret Ramban, which is actually giving us a different perspective. A perspective that's really more about each person and himself. Not so much the other people. Not so much who you're with, but rather who you are and where you are in the most intimate times. So in the beginning of the fifth chapter, as we start the fourth path, this chapter is called Aderich HaRevi'i, which is translated, uh, this is to the fourth path, and Bekavanat HaChibur, which is the intention of union. What does it mean, the intention of union? So the Ramban says as follows, you need to understand the great secret stated by our sages of blessed memory. As it says in the Gemara in Masechet Yoma, page 29a, the thought of sin is more severe than the sin itself. Anyone that has heard this statement before, that's because you probably watched our Tikkun Abrit movie, and that is mentioned multiple times there and in many of our lectures, where the thought of sin is worse than the sin. We've discussed this in different uh, aspects of this beautiful diamond, but we're going to add a few other aspects of the diamond later tonight, Bezot Hashem. But here the Ramban says that this particular statement, the sages literally toiled and toiled over this statement in countless farim, in countless places. I mean, this is mentioned in the Gemara Masechet Yoma, but you see one sage after another discussing it, whether it's the Rambam, the Ramban, uh, Rabbeinu Yonah, uh, or you look at the world of Hasidut, or you look at the world of Alacha. Literally, this statement is constantly repeated and discussed and elaborated and ex- ideas are extrapolated from it in so many different directions. It's literally a world of its own because at face value, It doesn't make sense. At face value, you look at it, it says, wait, the the thoughts of sin are worse than a sin? How could that be? Now, we know that, generally speaking, if you think about something bad, it's not a sin at all. If you do a sin, it's a sin, even if you didn't put too much thought into it. Meaning, if you thought about desecrating Shabbat, chas v'shalom, it's not a sin. It's not good, but it's definitely not a sin. If you desecrated Shabbat, that's a sin. That's a din karet. That is genom forever if you don't do tshuva. If you thought about eating non-kosher, it's not a sin. It's not good, but it's not a sin. If you ate non-kosher, you have a very serious problem because if it's a certain part of the animal, like chelev, that's also din karet. That's also genom. And according to the Baal in, uh, uh, he says that uh, eating non-kosher is the genom of shelek, the genom of, of, uh, of uh, snow. So there's different levels, there's different types of genom. There's genom of fire, there's genom of snow different chambers of genom. The point being is, is that you have yourself a situation here where thinking of a sin is not a sin until you go to idolatry. Disgusting idolatry, Christianity, Catholicism, Buddhism, you know, idolatry of of, of people, idolatry of things, all of that. That's a sin even if you simply think about it. But that's just one thing. That is just one thing. That if you think about it, it's a sin. If you do it, it's obviously a much bigger sin. But thinking about it is a sin. Not as bad as doing it, but certainly is a sin. But that's just one thing. So you can't just make this statement that the thoughts of sin are worse than the sin, and yet you only have one sin as an example. And it's not even really an example because the thoughts of sin are not worse than the sin 
Because as I said, the thought of idolatry is bad. Actual idolatry is genom forever. It's horrible. It's atrocious. It's yeshu, being boiled in, 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 in boiling feces. So it's really not worse. So we're back to square one again. Where is the thought of sin worse than the sin? Certainly, the face value analysis brings us to the conclusion that we cannot look at this statement by the sages in their extraordinary divine wisdom at face value. We can't look at the statement at face value and we can't really look at any of the statements in the Torah at face value. This is one of the mistakes that the heretics and the idolaters of the world commonly do where they try to actually read the Torah and the prophets literally as if it's some uh, Harry Potter book and they could simply translate it the way they want. This is why you're never going to see uh, the, uh, the common pastor, priest, uh, missionary out there quote any of the previous uh, 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 wise men of his, uh, of his belief system. He's more uh, likely to, uh, to quote uh, people that are not even uh, Christian, people that are not even within his, uh, his, his belief system in their lectures and their statements. Because each person, according to their belief system, could simply understand the text just as well as the next. Because they all read it literally. In the Jewish world, it's quite the opposite. We run away from any personal interpretations. And when it comes to a chidush, a new insight that a person has, it's not really a complete new insight that the world has never seen any realm of it because for it to be qualified as a real chidush it has to stand on the foundation of the words of the sages and not contradict it meaning that you can't just say listen you know what i read the statements the verses in the torah to talk about kosher and my chidush is that pig is kosher now that can never be a chidush. Why? Because we have the Torah outright saying what's allowed, what's not allowed. We have the extrapolation from the Torah by the sages that's in our oral Torah. What's not exactly is not allowed. Why it's not allowed. A, uh, uh, how, how certain things uh, uh, can be used, cannot be used, and so on and so forth. There's obviously a whole uh, work uh, that's uh, 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 of, uh, of Torah that's you know, goes into every single thing uh, and an analysis of that goes into every single thing and explain to us, you know, why this particular statement says what it says the way it says it because every single letter, every single word, and every single sentence is structured in such a fashion that Hashem wants us to learn from every part of it. So the sages gave us all of that commentary all of the extrapolation from it and anything else that you're going to get from it has to stand on top of that meaning it cannot contradict everybody if the sages said no you can't just decide yes if the sages said yes you can't just decide no if the sages said that Moshe Rabbeinu is the one that did it and that's the universal opinion you can't just say no no it wasn't you it wasn't Moshe it was uh it was my friend Lior doesn't work that way so a chidush is not really a chidush in a sense that it's a brand new idea that comes out of nowhere but rather it is a uh, further uh, uh, elaboration or clarification or insight that's from an existing idea the only uh, source of bringing something from nothing is the is the Torah itself everything else has to stand on something that already exists so now, we go back to our issue at hand that we have this bold statement, certainly not the new one, or not, not, a, not the first time, that the Ramban spoke about the AI mindset. The Rambam spoke about the AI mindset. In fact, the Torah 
spoke about the AI mindset. And at the same time, spoke about this statement that we have yet to clarify tonight, which is the thought of sin is worse than the sin. This is a certain truth. It's an absolute truth that the thought of sin is worse than a sin. Even though, if you're watching me for the first time, you have no idea what I'm talking about yet. This is an absolute truthful statement. How could it be? The Shulchan Aruch in Or Chaim, in Siman 60, Alacha number 4. And the same goes with the Mishnah Brua in Siman 60, Alacha number 7. Discuss how mitzvot require kavana. If you're going to fulfill a mitzvah, you have to put kavana into it. What's kavana? Intention. You have to think about it and do it in such a fashion where you've put thought into this mitzvah and not the empty-minded, robotic, AI type of mindset that doesn't ask any questions, that simply operates because it's told to and really functions no better and sometimes inferior to AI. If you're going to put on tefillin, you have to think about tefillin. In fact, the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says that you have to make sure to think about tefillin at all times that the tefillin are on you. This is the reason why some tzaddikim <clears throat> don't leave the tefillin on for very long because they know themselves that <clears throat> they get distracted by different things and they do not want to have tefillin on for even a moment when they're not thinking about tefillin. Needless to say, the, uh, the, the body itself has to be clean. This is the reason why we don't give tefillin to children or to people that don't know how to clean themselves if somebody has some type of uh, uh, physical uh, problems, some uh, health issues, and their body uh, constantly has filth on it, uh, or they cannot control their their uh, their uh, their ability to uh, flatulate or not, you know, these are people that are absolved from the mitzvah of putting on tefillin, because you cannot do these things uh, while you have tefillin, and certainly you cannot have <clears throat> any type of fecal manner. Uh, type of filth on your body when it to fill on you but when it comes to a person that's putting on to fill in they have to think about the to fill in at all times this is the reason why if you know that let's say for example you didn't sleep all night uh and uh you have it's time to pray but you know that uh you know you're gonna fall asleep you're not gonna last that entire shachrit prayer without falling asleep the best thing to do is simply to put on a tefillin do the shmais do the blessing do the bracha and take them off and then continue the prayer as best as you can without the tefillin on without the tefillin on so it's a uh, it's important for a person to constantly think about it and then certainly never fall asleep with the tefillin on it's a uh, it's a sin but the same thing goes when it comes to other mitzvot. If you're simply going to pray, you pray your mincha prayer, you pray your uh, your alvit prayer, you pray uh, during the holidays, during Shabbat. If you're going to do the bilkat mazon, if you're going to do a blessing over a food that you're about to eat or you just completed eating, you have to have kavana. You have to have the intention and not be an AI mindset type of person where you're simply doing it because you grew up doing it, you've gotten yourself accustomed to doing it, you're used to doing it, and so much so that it's become second nature for you. That as soon as you pick up a food, you just say the blessing. As soon as you leave the bathroom, you say a blessing. As soon as you uh, 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 you know are about to do something, you know, doing these blessings and prayers has become robotic and uh, really, more or less without much kavana, because Shukhan Aruch says that mitzvah requires kavana. Now, when a person does things in a robotic AI mindset type of uh, way, there's a term for it, mitzvat anashim melumada, which is a mitzvah without kavana that's performed mindlessly. 
loose translation or interpretation by me. Arab Ephraim explains that when a person does mitzvot in a mindless way, meaning without thinking them through, without even thinking what they're saying, with uh, you know, with without really putting any type of uh, a heart into it, if it happens every so often, that's one thing. But if it's a lifestyle, meaning the person as simply that's the way they are. They wake up in the morning, they say modani, they do the morning blessings, they go to shul, they put on tefillin. Before they eat breakfast, they eat, they make a blessing. On the uh, way out of town, as soon as they cross the uh, boundaries of the city, they say berkota aderech, the the blessing uh, uh, they, to get protection for the way. They do the blessings, they do the prayers, but they do it robotically, they do it mindlessly. This person could even get to the point where they will be learning Torah. In a Bet Midrash, in a Kolel, in a Shiur Torah, they're listening to it. But they're listening to it mindlessly. They're reading it. But they're reading it robotically. Just to occupy time, to show up on the attendance sheet, to be there, to be part of the community. That type of person could literally be 100% an idol worshiper and do all of those things. Where they could literally have actual beliefs of idolatry, all forms of idolatry, whether it's Yoshke, or it's that God needs you, or that the Torah has mistakes in it, or all types of foolishness that people have in their minds at times. But yet they can go to shul and practice and do and, 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 and simply be no different than an AI. In fact, in some cases worse. Because the AI is never going to start, you know, typing to you out of nowhere and say, hey, you want me to show you the, uh, how to write a book about two little kids running to a store and then on the way one of them got in trouble and then make a song for it? It's never going to do that for you. If you ask it to do it for you, it'll probably write your story. But it's not going to wake up in the morning and simply decide to give you props. On the other hand, the person that has this mindset where their prayers and servitude of Hashem altogether is done in a mindless way, they could literally be much more damaging because they communicate with people. And when they communicate with people, they communicate their thoughts. They communicate their beliefs. And they don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with telling the entire world that they don't believe that the G'dolei adult throughout all of the generations are wrong about A, B, and C. In fact, they could even write a whole blog about it. They could write articles about it. They could attest to it as if it's Torah Mi Sinai, that what they believe is 100% true and is the truth of all truth, even though they are a lonely opinion. But they all manipulate the words of sages, the words of, of different chachamim, in order to make it seem as if everyone agrees with them except everybody that's alive. Now, mitzvat anashim melumada. This is a mitzvah without kavana perform mindless, mindlessly that can put a person in a position where they literally can have a idolatrous mindset. An idolatrous mindset, Rabotai. The book of Isaiah gives us some clarification. Now, of course, Every person knows that Musal is sometimes painful because it reminds us of things we need to do. 
And no one likes to be told what to do. Shlomo Melech says in Proverbs chapter 1, uh, the, the, literally the first couple of verses, where he says, he says, why do we learn, what is this Proverbs for? In order to make known words of wisdom and discipline, that's Musal, to make words of understanding discernible, that's to understand what the statement like, the thought of sin is worse than a sin actually means. To accept wise discipline, musar eskel, righteousness, justice, and fairness, to provide simpletons with cleverness, a youth with knowledge and design, that a wise one may hear and increase his learning, and a discerning one may acquire strategies to understand parable and an epigram, the words of the wise and their enigmas. Here Shlomo HaMelech, the wisest man, is telling us wisdom doesn't come painlessly. In fact, wisdom is coupled with discipline. True wisdom is coupled with discipline because wisdom requires change. Change is not always pleasant. Change requires a person to acknowledge that he may sometimes be a simpleton. She may simply be ignorant. It's okay to be ignorant as long as you understand that that's where you are and you are now looking to acquire knowledge and solve that problem of ignorance. Now, the Shlomo Medech says further, my child in chapter 2, My child, if you accept my words and treasure my commandments with yourself to make your ears attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding, for only if you call out to understanding and give forth your voice to discernment, if you seek it as if it were silver, if you search for it as if it were hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of Hashem and discover the knowledge of God. For Hashem grants wisdom, from, the, from His mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Here, Shlomo Melech again reminds us of the need for Musa, the need for this divine wisdom, rather than simply it's a good idea. Anytime a person reads about the Jews of the previous generation, the stories that are in the Tanakh, you will often see the flaws, whether it's in last week's parasha, this week's parasha, next week's parasha. There were many flaws, there were many failures. In this week's parasha, we see that the parasha Shlach has the meraglim, the spies. The spies go out and bring a bad report. And then they complain, not only to Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron, but to everyone. And they're punished with an endless punishment. Everyone is punished, including the children. The parents, the people that were from the age of 20 to 60, get punished that they do not enter the land. The kids get punished that they also don't enter the land until their parents die. In the desert. So these kids, although they're eventually going to enter the land of Israel, they get punished by simply reliving this issue every year as they see on Rosh Hashanah, people die. They had to sleep in, they had to, you know, dig graves for themselves. And not not everyone got up out of the grave the next morning. So this is something that the entire nation had to live for 40 years. The prophet Malachi says that when we failed, we failed miserably. And it was because we didn't listen to teachings that Shlomo Melech said. 
We put Musar aside. We put our minds aside. We put our flesh first. We put our desires first. Before we get to the what was really the big deal of the sin of the spies, we want to see the prophet Malachi remind us in chapter 2, verse number 10, where he talks about intermarriage. And he says that this intermarriage is an abomination. It's a betrayal of Hashem. In verse 12, he says, May Hashem eliminate the man who does this. Any child and descendant from the tents of Yaakov and anyone who might present an offering to Hashem, Master of Legions. And then he says, and you say, why? Why, why do this? It's because Hashem has testified between you and the wife of your youth, whom you have betrayed, though she is your companion and the wife of your covenant. He says, when we didn't listen to Musar, our bodies led us to do things that are forbidden. Not only forbidden in the eyes of God, where they married non-Jewish women, but also forbidden in the eyes of men, where they cheated on their wives. They had a Jewish wife, but they got themselves a non-Jewish girlfriend. Why? Simple. They didn't listen to Musar. They didn't listen to wisdom. They listened to their bodies. But how do you get to that? The prophet Isaiah, in chapter 29, verse 13 and 14, says as follows, V'yomer Adonai, Ya'an ki negesh, A'am azeh bepivu bisfatav kibduni, V'libo richak mimeni, V'ti'i irata moti mitzvat anashim melumada. לכן אינני יוסף להפלי את העם הזה, אפלה ופלא, ועבדה חוכמת חכמיו, ובינת נבוניו תסתתר. The Lord said, Inasmuch as this people has drawn close, with its mouth and with its lips it has honored me, yet it has distanced its heart from me. Their fear of me is like wrote learning of human commands. And therefore, behold, I will continue to perform more wonders against this people. Wonder upon wonder, the wisdom of its wise men will be lost, and the understanding of its sages will become concealed. Here, Kadosh Baruch Hu says, look, they all look religious. They say religious things. They have the hats, they have the beards, they have the big synagogue, they have the big yeshiva, but don't let looks deceive you. They're not necessarily always what they appear to be. And in this generation, he says, they honor me with their lips. They say great praises. They say Baruch Hashem. They say Be'ezrat Hashem. They say, Ishtabach Shimo, which is, may his name be uh, blessed. All types of wonderful things, they say. They even give shurim about me. They give lectures to people, oh, you should have emuna. Have faith in God. Have bitachon in God. Trust in God. God will help. These are great statements, says Hashem. But in reality... Their hearts are far away from me. Why are the hearts far away from me? Because all of these statements, all of these lectures, all of these prayers are simply a form of communication. It's become their culture. They grew up hearing Bezrat Hashem. They grew up hearing Baruch Hashem. So, you ask the guy, oh, how are you? Oh, Baruch Hashem. Now, do you really mean Baruch Hashem? Like, did you think about Hashem when you said that? Like, wow, praise this Hashem that He gave me such a situation that I'm in. He gave me a wife. 
give me kids, give me a house, there's enough food to make me fatter, there's all types of wonderful things in my life. And yes, Baruch Hashem, I also have this problem and that problem and that problem and Baruch Hashem for that. Did you actually think all of that or you just said Baruch Hashem? Did you think Baruch Hashem? Or did you say Baruch Hashem? Many times people say Baruch Hashem. But they don't think Baruch Hashem. You tell the guy, listen, are you going to show up to the meeting? Yeah, Be'ezrat Hashem. Do you really mean Be'ezrat Hashem, that you need Hashem's help to come? You need Hashem's help to get there? Is there some trouble that perhaps we should pray for you also to get there? Do you have like a chronic problem that perhaps you need some divine assistance to get you to get there? Did you think Be'ezrat Hashem? Or did you just say Be'ezrat Hashem? Are you coming to pray today? Mincha, it's at 7 o'clock. Yeah, yeah, sure. And say, I'll be there. Everyone's praying. He's already finished. Five, ten minutes before everybody else. The Chazan gets to Alenu Lishabach. He says, Alenu. He doesn't even say Lishabach. He doesn't complete the two paragraphs. He just said, Alenu. The guy already walked out of the place. He's saying Alenu Lishabach like it's Birkot Aderech, like it's a, the prayer on the way. He's walking away as he's saying it. Wait, so your prayer, did you even, did you talk to God? Or did you just talk? Did you come to pray to him or you just came to be part of the community? In so many words, did you have any kavana, any intention in what you did when you prayed, when you made a blessing, when you said Baruch Hashem, when you said Bezad Hashem? Or did you just do it just like AI does it? Kadosh Baruch Hu says in this verse to the prophet Isaiah, you know why I'm going to punish them? With a unique punishment where their wisdom will be lost, where the words of their sages will be concealed from them, they won't even understand them when they're spoken to them. They'll hear a shiur Torah, but they won't understand a single word. They'll read a book. They'll open a Gemara. They'll open a Poskim. They'll open some Sefer Hasidut. They'll read an entire page. Maybe understand two words. Not because of a language barrier, but rather because of a mental barrier. Why? Why would you do that, Hashem? Don't you want us to learn your Torah? Yes. But they don't want to learn Torah. They just want to be here. They just want to be part of the community. They just want to show up to shul because they know that if they didn't show up to shul, people will start calling them. And you go, okay, well, how come you're not coming anymore? You still religious? Do you go to a different shul? People ask too many questions. It takes too much time. So let me just show up. Hashem says, keep doing me. In their mouth, in their lips, they honor me. They say, Baruch Hashem. They say, Bezot Hashem. But their hearts are far away from me. They're not thinking about me. Not when they're praying, not when they're blessing. They're thinking about the stock market. They're thinking about their girlfriend. They're thinking about all types of things. It's a horrible situation. A Kadosh Baruch who says that his people have turned into AI. Shemishmo. And their punishment is that if they so decided today, you know what, I'm going to listen to Shil Torah. Today I'm going to do it. Hashem says, my Torah doesn't dance to your tune. Meaning just because you decided to show up today, finally after five years of not listening to anything and not caring about anything, and you finally decided to tune into the Shi'ul Torah, and you finally decided to learn some Musar, and you finally decided to open a Gemara and actually pay attention to what's being said in the Daf Yomi Shi'ul, my Torah is not going to just uncover itself and say, here is all the secrets. In fact, it'll be bitter for you because you won't understand the majority of what you're reading 
the majority of what's being said because the Torah will be concealed from you. And only after removing that klipa that you've developed from ignoring my Torah, from ignoring my existence, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, from treating us as if we're insignificant and your thoughts and desires are more significant, only then, when you finally understand, you have to fix it and you toil and you prove that this is what you want, will my Torah uncover itself. Here, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is giving us a very serious warning for our generation, for every generation. It's not written in the prophets for that generation. It's written for us. The Gemara in Masechet Megillah says, Am Yisrael had 55 prophets mentioned in the Tanakh out of 1.2 million that we actually had over the years. Why 55 out of 1.2 million? Says the Gemara, because those 55, everything they said was for all generations. The others, million plus, they said good things. They said holy things. They said the word of Hashem. But it was relevant to their generation. And therefore, it did not become part of the eternal Torah. Whatever's in that Tanakh, it's for you. It's for me. It's for him. It's for her. It's for everyone. Forever. So here, Rabotai, the prophet Isaiah gives us a warning that Mitzvat Anashim Elumada is what we were doing that led to a disaster in knowledge, a disaster in wisdom, because we said what was supposed to be said, but our feelings, our thoughts, nowhere to be found. They were in the lost and found department in some airport with the luggage. Now, the Rambam discusses this statement by the Gemara Masechet Yoma of the thoughts of sin are worse than the sin. But before we get to the Rambam's elaboration of it, we first have to understand what does Rav Ephraim mean that a person can have a literally thoughts of an idol worshiper yet go to shul yet be religious in a sefer that was written by one of his rabbanim years ago extraordinary Talmud Chacham Rav Yeshua Solomon Zatzal he was Ish Kodesh, Ish Emet. On Shabbat, he made it uh, one of his things that he would literally go and lay on the street if he had to stop somebody from driving on Shabbat. Rav Yashiv loved him dearly. He's a Gaon, Adir, Kodesh, zealous of zealous, literally the Pinchas of his generation. Rav Yeshua Solomon loved Rav Ephraim dearly, like a above and beyond the normal Talmud, which was unique, especially in those times. We have, there was more tension between the Ashkenazim and the Sfaradim. Rav Solomon was Ashkenazi, Rav Ephraim is Sfaradi, but they had a very unique relationship. And he learned a lot from him. In his Sefer, Sefer Ner David, he writes as follows. There is avodat a nefesh and avodat a goof. And this is the difference between a Jew and a Gentile. As a Jew, you're commanded to do the avodat a nefesh and goof, or avodat a nefesh mainly, and as the guy only required to do avodat a goof.
What is this? What is Avodat HaNefesh, Avodat HaGuf? Says that servitude of Hashem has to have an impact on your nefesh, which is your soul, but also has to be impact you as far as your behavior, your goof, your body. He says that the Jew has to serve Hashem in order for him to improve in his behavior, but also in his mindset, also in his, uh, uh, his, his spiritual status. He has to elevate himself. He has to think pure, not just act pure. The goy, the non-Jew, doesn't have to do all that. He just simply has to be good. Don't kill anybody. Don't rob anyone. Don't serve an idol. Now this is not just a commandment. This is a reality. Many of you are going to hate this reality. I promise you. Especially if you're not Jewish. But a reality is a reality. Even if it doesn't make us feel good inside. I have personal experience with this and I have seen this reality years before I learned it. But it's a reality that Baruch Salomon puts into perspective that's literally unbelievable. Now certainly, many are going to disagree until they see this in real life. And they realize, oh wow, the sages were right. The commandment of Avodat HaNefesh and Avodat HaGuf are on the Jew, not just because that's what Hashem wants, but rather because that's what He is capable of doing. The commandment on the Gentile, the Goy, to do Avodat HaGuf is only the Guf, not because... He doesn't need to do the Avodat Anifesh, but rather he can't. He's incapable of doing it. Now you're going to say, wait a minute, what are we talking about? Rav Solomon brings us an example. He says, We see in the Gemara in Masechet Kiddushin, page 31a, a famous story which is. The pshat of it is to teach us kibud avaim, honoring our parents. And Ula says, we learn honoring our parents and how far you need to go for the sake of honoring our parents from the act of a Gentile named Dama Benetina. Dama Benetina was a wealthy Gentile who was taught by his parents that honoring them is of highest magnitude. And one day, when the sages of Am Yisrael were sent near and far to go look for a stone to replace the one that was lost from the Choshen, from the coin Gadol's Choshen, one of the stones fell and got lost, and they had to replace it. And they were willing to pay endless amount of money for it. They found out that Dama ben Natina possessed the stone. They went to him, and he says, yes, you're right, I do have this stone. Well, how much do you want for it? I want 60 zoos. They said, fine, we'll pay you 60 zoos. He goes, and he comes back. He says, I'm sorry, I can't sell it to you now. So the Jewish people clearly thought this is him hardballing us. He saw how quickly we agreed. We didn't even negotiate. So he realized we need it. Yeah, let's just give him more money. Okay, we'll give you 80. He says, no, no, no. It's not the money. It's just, I can't sell it to you right now. Okay, no, come on. We need it. Fine, you got us. A hundred. No, it's not. I'm not going to get, I can't sell it to you right now, he says. They continued increasing the price. 
many times over. Hundreds of zoos they were willing to offer him. When it started only at 60, that he's the one that quoted. Didn't agree. Eventually, the Jewish people realized, okay, this guy doesn't want to sell it to us. He, obviously, there's something wrong here, but nothing we could do. They left. But shortly after, they saw Dan Benatina chase them. Hey, 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 Rabbis, rabbis. I got the stone. Okay. So they were ready to give him a few hundred zoos. We're talking about, let's just say, let's just call it a f- half a million dollars. No, 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 no. We agreed to 60,000. 60,000 is 60,000. They said that, wait a minute. We asked you how much. You said 60,000. We said yes. You went, you came back, you said no. We offered 80,000, you said no. We offered 100, you said no. We offered 200,000, you said no. We offered 600,000. You still said no. Now, you're saying, let's just go back to the 60,000? Can you at least explain yourself? He says, no, you don't understand. I already agreed to sell it to you at 60,000. My word is important to me. But the reason why I couldn't sell it to you is because as soon as I got to go, you know, to where the stone is, I saw that my father is sleeping and his legs are resting on top of the safe. And I simply couldn't wake him up. It's not honoring my father. This was a very big act. How this guy would just, psh, without learning Torah, without learning Musar, he has such honor for his parents, such a big mitzvah. So the sages teach us, look how great his act was and look how Hashem rewarded him where a year later, he had one of his cows give birth to a perfect red heifer. Now anyone who doesn't know, there's only been eight red heifers in history. We need the red heifer for the Bet HaMikdash. As once it's slaughtered, it's burned, they take the ashes, they combine it with a couple of things, and this is the only way to purify people. People that have touched dead people, people that have ta- went to cemeteries, people that have touched certain uh, uh, dead animals. The only way to purify them is with this red heifer. So it was very critical to have it. He had a perfect red heifer, red cow, where he couldn't have even two hairs that were not black. He had this. The sages found out and quickly went to go buy it. And they said to him, how much do you want for it? He says to them, listen, I know about this red heifer. I know that you Jews would pay me any amount of money that I ask for, for this red heifer. But all I want is the money that I lost due to the honor of my father a year ago. Sages paid him what he wanted. He became even wealthier than what he was. That's the story. Comes Rav Salomon in his Sefer near David. He says, what do we learn from here aside from the story and honoring and that Hashem rewards both the Jews and the Gentiles for good things, even in this world? What else do we learn here? We learn the difference between Jew and the Gentile. Where the Jew is obligated on the mitzvah of avodat anefesh and the mitzvah of avodat aguf. Serving a Kadosh Baruch Hu to elevate his spiritual status, his soul, his thoughts, his mindset, and his body. Don't kill anybody. Don't rob anyone. Don't beat up anyone. Don't steal anything. Don't eat too much. Don't eat things that are not kosher. Both body and soul. The Gentile, only the body. 
Not because we don't want his soul. He can't give it. We see that in this story. It says Rabbi Yeshua Solomon. Dama Benetina did such a great act that it's memorized and literally part of the eternal oral Torah. It's, it's part of the Torah. It's never coming out. What he did was such a great thing that Akadosh Baruch Hu made sure that this is part of the Torah. Now imagine you did something. You are 10 years old, 12 years old, 20 years old. It was a great thing. You, I don't know, saved somebody. I know there's uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, religious guy bought a desk, a used desk, and then he found like $80,000 in it. And he gave it back to the owner. And this was put on the news. And he went on different uh, you know, news channels. It was a big Kiddush Hashem. How this Jew did such a big thing. And everybody knows that's the Jew that gave back $80,000 to the desk. Wow, amazing. And that's, But in reality, a few years passed. And the story is done. I'm sure his wife remembers it. He remembers it. A few close family members and friends remember it. But it's not necessarily the topic of conversation every day. Let's just say that. And certainly some of the people in the community don't even know that he's related to the story and perhaps don't even know the story. But let's just say they do. At some point, it's forgotten. It's, you know, okay, he did something good, good for him. So maybe the story will live for a few years, maybe even a generation. But only once in a while does a story get chosen by Hashem to live for more than just a generation. Perhaps a few generations, a few hundred years. And even that, where you have a story of a great thing that someone did, that's remembered and told in many different versions of it and many different lessons from it over a period of hundreds of years, even that is not as great as what happened to this Goy Dama Benetina. He has a story that's part of an eternal Torah. So, surely, all of the other people that have done something good, they got whatever recognition they got, and then they, uh, you know, move on. But they don't move on in the same way they moved on in the past. Why? Because now they're the guy that did this something good. They're the guy that wrote the book. They're the guy that saved somebody's life. They're the woman that, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, saved humanity. Whatever they did. So they're no longer walking the same way they walked like they did before that day. And they'll last for a period of time. Now, if it's a Jew and they did something great, they won't just act differently. They'll start thinking differently because it'll elevate their neshama. If you did a big mitzvah, you not only eliminated some klipa that was holding you back from elevating yourself spiritually, understanding the Torah further, having your mind open to more wisdom, behaving even better, having the strength to, to, to improve yourself, but you also are acting better as far as physically. Suddenly your, your midot are better, your sensitivities are better. So the Jew that does this big mitzvah is elevated and he can build on that, she can build on that and they continue elevating themselves like a extraordinarily amazing trajectory to becoming a tzaddik, to becoming a tzaddikah. Now, if you, let's say, for example, 
just completed Masechet Shabbat. And you have Masechet Yomah being delivered to you tomorrow. Now, if I would have asked you, do you think that you can finish Masechet Yomah before Yom Kippur? If I would have asked you that a few years ago, you told me, Rabbi, I'm new, I can't, it's too much for me. But since I'm asking you on a video and I'm telling you that's what you need to do, now you say, wait, can I do it? I think I could do it. Do you know why you think you could do it? Because you just finished Masechet Shabbat. And the one that's spoken to knows who I'm speaking about. Both of them. You see, Rabotai, you have an extra strength that you got as a result of this big thing. This big thing you did. It didn't just give you physical strength. It gave you spiritual strength. Your neshama all of a sudden has muscles. You never knew existed. But that's only if you're a Jew. If you're not Jew. Like Dama ben Tina says, Rabbi, uh, Yeshua Solomon, you don't have that. How do we know you don't have it? Look at what happened. Dama ben Tina, a year passed. His act was such a great act. Akadosh Baruch Hu signed it into the eternal Torah. It literally doesn't get better than that. It's not... Oh, he read something, he spoke something, he... No, no, this is literally a life story, an event that took a short period of time, got commemorated into an eternal Torah. It simply does not get better than that. He didn't just find a wallet, save the baby, you know, stop the train. He did something that a Kadosh Baruch Hu says, this is part of my Torah. This will never be forgotten. 2,500 years after it happened, some crazy rabbi is going to say it on YouTube. I make a half a sure about it. That's how important the story is. So you would think, this Dama Benetina is now going to be, you know what? I can't just be Dama Benetina anymore. I got to be like Rabbi Dama Benetina. I got to be like the sage Dhamma Benetina. I got to be really righteous. I got to do good things. I got to show people how to honor their parents. Maybe I have a whole course. I got to convert to Judaism already. I got to be a big rabbi. You would think with such a story that's stamped into an eternal Torah, Dhamma Benetina would be Rabenu Dhamma or something. But says Rav Solomon, it didn't happen. A year later, all he can think about, can I have that money that I lost because of that honor of my father? That's all you can think about? That's it? You lost? Wait, you honored your father. It's commemorated in our Torah. We're telling this story to all of our kids. Yeah, yeah, mitzvah, mitzvah, good, good deed. Yeah, yeah, it's nice, but I lost money. Can you give me the money for that? That's dumb, Benetina. Why? The soul is incapable of being elevated due to his acts. Because a Jew has a soul that's tuned to know that you never lose from a mitzvah. There's no such thing as losing from a mitzvah. You always benefit. Yeah, but you just gave away that money and then you lost the money that you had left and if you didn't give that money, you would have had that money. A Jew knows that's not the case. Why? If he's tuned, if his, if his neshama is tuned with Torah, he knows what Torah is, he knows what giving is, he knows what a mitzvah is, at least to a certain extent. He knows, listen, I gave, that's a mitzvah. I lost, that's what Hashem wanted. Had I not given, I probably would have lost much more. In fact, I could have lost my life. In so many words, giving saved my life, where I only had to lose money, and not my health or my life. Yeah, but had you did this, you... No, no, no. A Jew never loses from a mitzvah. I don't lose from mitzvot. Yeah, but it costs this and it does this. You never lose. I've only gained from mitzvot. There is no such thing as losing from a mitzvah. 
No such thing. On the other hand, the Goy doesn't think that way. The Goy thinks of how much does it cost to do a mitzvah? How much does it cost to be a Jew? How much does it cost to convert? How much does it cost to put those little boxes on your head? How much does it cost to do this? And how much did I already give? And how much uh, I already sacrificed? Do you know how much it cost me to move here? Do you know how much I sacrificed in my last job just to do this, this, and this? Do you know how much I gave? And do you know how much I give? No, nor do we care. Why? Because that type of language is not Jewish language. It's not Jewish language. And if a Jew speaks like that, Rav Ephraim says, his mindset is closer to that of the Goy than it is to the Jew that he's supposed to be. And he has to check himself. So you see, Rabotai, when a Jew does a mitzvah, his neshama improves. He now has the ability to do more. When a goy does a mitzvah, his body improves. But the neshama doesn't have that yearning for more. Now, this is what Rav Solomon teaches. Now I'm going to teach you some personal experience. Years ago, I had a student wanted to convert. I've told this story numerous times, but there's a reason for I'm telling you again because there's others, unfortunately. This student was coming to the lectures for a few years. He literally looked more Jewish than you and I. Only thing left for him to do was to move to a Jewish community. I kept pressing him for it and telling him, no, come on, move already. You're not unemployed. You're not homeless. Just get an apartment in a Jewish community. What's the big deal? He goes, no, Rabbi, I found the house, but the guy wants too much money. So I'm waiting for him to, you know, negotiate. So out of curiosity, I asked him, how much money are you talking about here that's holding up this conversion and everything that you're doing? How much are you talking about here? What is it, like a few thousand dollars a month? What, what, what are you talking about here? Because no, no, it's only renting, and, and you know, no, it's not that much. I'm like, so what is he talking about? He wants, uh, you know, four thousand. You want to give him thirty-eight or something? Uh, uh, you want to give him three? You want to give him two? Like what? What is he? He goes, no, no. He wants uh, fifteen hundred, but the house is only worth thirteen. I said, excuse me. What? He said, no, he wants fifteen hundred, and I told him it's only worth thirteen hundred. I said, wait, you're telling me that you are holding back on your conversion, your move, your life, your eternity for $200? The look on his face was like, yeah, what? What's the problem? I realize he doesn't understand what he's doing. He didn't realize what he's doing. I told him, Listen, forget the negotiation. Give him the money because you're risking losing everything. He didn't listen to me. And it wasn't literally a matter of a couple of months before he stopped coming to the classes. The guy apparently never negotiated for those $200. He just simply found somebody to pay him the price. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu simply removed this guy has desire to convert altogether. Four years he's coming to my class. At least ten years before me, he's in the Jewish world in one way or another. For $200, he lost it all. One day, HaKadosh Baruch Hu removed the desire to be a Jew. That's example number one. There are unfortunately, one of the biggest risks that you have with people that want to convert, but delay it unnecessarily, or they simply don't follow the rules, is they don't realize what's on the line. They don't realize that this 
unnatural desire to be a Jew, to be part of the chosen people, is a gift. And they don't realize that gift could be taken back. And many times what ends up happening is that those very same people can actually become anti-Semitics. There's one guy, he's been communicating with me on email for years already, asking all types of questions, watches all the lectures, my lectures, other rabbis' lectures, and has questions. And I had, Baruch Hashem, the ability to answer many of his questions. And I tried to treat him very nicely over the years, even though I have no idea if he's ever donated a single dollar. Today, I'm pretty sure he's never donated to this day even a single dollar. But my, my uh, uh, help to people doesn't depend on donations or not donations. If I could help, I help. Anyway, this guy at some point started asking questions that were a little off. It started sounding strange. And it became a pattern. And then I started realizing that he started watching more than just our lectures. He started watching some of the stuff he used to watch. He started watching some of the anti-Semites. And I warned him. I told him, listen, you're thinking that you're doing something good by finding out what the anti-Semites are doing. If you continue this way, you're going to become like them. You're going to become anti-Semite. You're going to become an anti-Semite. You're going to become a Nazi. Well, it wasn't too long after. Literally, we're talking about maybe six months later. He sends me an email. And he says, he gives me a rebuke. He gives me a rebuke of how he doesn't think I have the right mentality. And although I helped him stop wasting seed, it wasn't really because of me that he stopped, but rather because I'm the one that showed him that God hates, that, uh, that the Jews hate the non-Jews and want to turn us into, want to turn the, uh, the non-Jews into slaves by promoting pornography. Literally, the perversion of his mind went to such an extent that Forget about saying, having gratitude, saying thank you. He literally used the one thing that was keeping him in, keeping him in the spiritual battle. He wasn't wasting seed as much. Now he says, no, no, I only stopped because I saw how you Jews are trying to turn us all uh, goyim into slaves. Who says that? Nazis. He became a Nazi again. Why? He abandoned his desire to convert. He abandoned his desire to become a holy Jew. And literally, that all happened as a result of only his body changed with whatever good deeds he was doing, but not his soul. So therefore, when he stopped feeding himself truth and holiness, and instead was feeding himself perversion and stupidity and heresy, it was quick for the body to return to what it was, to continue wasting seed, to continue be, to go back to being a Nazi, to go back to being a, a, a heretic, to go back to being a nasty, disgusting, ungrateful person, to go back to that. And unfortunately, this is a common issue that happens with people you see this online. If you ever spend time online, Baruch Hashem, I don't do that. But uh, I've seen it in the past when I first started this. I remember seeing all the different comments, different people would literally make huge changes in a positive way, then decide that they can't convert because they can't afford to move or they can't afford to this or they, they can't get out of their marriage. You know, whatever the reason was why they couldn't convert. And from that moment on, literally the deterioration of the person is massive. They go from being the most zealous person for Torah and saying you have to love Hashem and you have to follow Torah and you have to, you know, say the truth to all of a sudden they hate Jews. All of a sudden they, they hate Torah. All of a sudden they question everything. Literally they become monsters. How? 
How did you go from being this decent human being that was doing nice things, doing uh, chesed, doing kiyuv, doing all, and all of a sudden you're an anti-Semite? Like, what, what happened to you? Simple. The neshama never changed. The goy neshama never changed, so it was very easy to go back to whatever he was before. If he had bad traits before, that's what he went back to. If he was a Nazi before, that's what he went back to. And in fact, many times much worse. When does the neshama change? After conversion. The second you convert, everything changes. Before that, even if you're giving a million dollars a second in staka, even if you're reading, even if you're writing, even if you're doing videos, the second you convert, everything changes. Until then, you're always at risk to go back to a worst version of your old self. This is why when people come, they ask for guidance and so on, I always tell them, do this as soon as you possibly can. Don't delay it because of you. If it's delayed because of the Bedin, because of the Rabbi, because of circumstances beyond your ability, that's not, that's not on you. But if you're delaying it because you're stingy, because you don't have enough faith in Hashem, because of all types of things that are within your control, you have a very serious problem. Why? You're putting everything on the line as if it's a casino. And you don't realize you can lose it just like that. Just like that. So a person can do good things. He could share lectures every day. He could give tzedakah. He could do kiruv. He could do a lot of things. All of that is good, goes to the good account. But the neshama doesn't grow with it. The body does. He can become a more decent human being. He can become a, uh, you know, a nicer and so on. But that's so long as he feeds himself good. Second he stops feeding himself the good, he could literally go back to being Amalek. How does a person get out of that? They have to make the leap. Now, making that leap is not always possible for everyone. Hence the reason why constantly learning and developing yourself and, and realizing this is necessary. Where even though this may have offended certain people and now they're going to use it for their little Amalek videos, let it be. Why? Because for those that are seeking the truth, this truth is necessary. Why? This may be the fire that you need to get yourself to where you need to be as far as conversion as soon as possible. And if you can't convert, at the very least you know what's on the line so you keep drinking the truth as often as possible. Because the moment you let go, it's gone. For a Jew, a Jew could also fall. A Jew could also become the worst person on planet Earth. But it's not in the same fashion. Because if a Jew does mitzvot, the more mitzvot he does, the more kedusha he adds, the more things he adds, the higher level his neshama is. Which means that for him to fall to the other side... It's many steps. It's not impossible. As you've all seen, there's many people, unfortunately, that uh, have proven otherwise, where they looked righteous, acted righteous, did righteous things for a period of time, and then, unfortunately, abandoned everything. But this wasn't really an overnight process. This was <clears throat> them stopping elevation, then doing acts of evil, which lowers them and lowers them and lowers them and lowers them and eventually gets them to a point where they literally become worse than any anti-Semite could ever be. There are some Jews that are literally, in a spiritual sense, worse than uh, Hitler himself. It was in a physical sense. So, all of this being said, we now get... To the statement the thoughts of sin are worse than the sin the Rambam writes in Morene Buchim in the third section and the reason why the thoughts of sin are worse than the sin is because as some of the sages say the neshama is in the brain this is like the place where it's the ultimate connection to God so sinning with the mind, it's like literally taking the treasure of the king and desecrating it. 
in Nefesh Chaim, Rabbi Chaim Ivolozhin writes, the mind is like the room of Yichud between you and Hashem. Only you and Hashem know what goes on there. Only you and Hashem know what goes on there. Hence the reason when you sin with the mind, when you look and think about inappropriate things, i.e. pornography, promiscuity, abominable uh, type of uh, acts and behaviors, that is not only a sin where the soul is desecrating it, but that is a sin that is literally attacking God in the most intimate area. The place where only he and you know. No one knows about these foreign thoughts that you have. No one knows of the perversions that are on your mind. No one knows of the desecration you have on your mind, except God. He says, this is the reason why sinning in your mind is worse than the sin of act. Because sinning with the body, that's like Titus. Fornicated with a prostitute inside the Kodesh Kodeshim of the Bet HaMikdash. Horrible thing. But he, Rabbi Chaim Yivolozhin says, that's nothing in comparison to one thought of pornography on your mind. Why? Over there he sinned. People saw it was a disgrace. But he's a disgrace. Nothing else is expected from him. It's just flesh and blood. He's just a piece of meat. It's like two pieces of uh, meat being slapped on each other and put on a barbecue. Who cares? But you, you the Jew that have an intimate relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, where only you and him are in this place called your mind and you allow these foreign things to enter that one place? Much worse, says Rabbi Chaim Ivoloshin. This is the Nefesh Chaim, I believe it's in chapter 4. So here we see, Rabotai, that the mind is a big deal. The Arizal says, the verse in the Torah that tells us that there's an obligation to build some type of protection on a roof. If you look at the letters, they spell out or they give the uh, meaning of the thoughts of sin are worse than the sin. By simply telling you, if you build a fence around your behavior, around your neshama, you won't have to worry about the thoughts of sin being worse than the sin. Because you won't have these foreign thoughts. If you learn Torah, observe the Torah, do the mitzvot with the right mindset and intention, that means that those foreign thoughts won't, won't enter your mind. And that's why the Rambam writes in Isuwebiya Biya in chapter 24, the thoughts of immorality only enter a mind that's empty of wisdom. A mind that's empty of wisdom means a, a mind that's empty of Torah. If you don't learn Torah, or you don't learn enough Torah, or you don't learn enough elevated Torah, you're going to continue thinking about pornography. You're going to th continue thinking about idolatry. You're going to continue thinking about things that are forbidden to you. You're going to continue thinking about money. You're going to thinking about all types of things all the time in the most inappropriate times. Now, when a student came to Arab Shlomo Zalman Oyerbach, Allah Shalom, one of the Bukhari Shiva came to him and said, Kvod Arav, I have a problem. I need to do a tikkun for sin of arayot, meaning immorality. What should I do? 
He says, since you're learning Torah, that's a big part of the tikkun. You don't need to do the fasts. But in addition to that, read the book of Tehilim, the entire book over the next 30 days. Combination with Torah, that should be sufficient. And of course, stop the sin, don't ever do it again. You'll be fine. Student thanked the Rav and walked out. As the student is at the bus stop, all of a sudden he looks to his right and he sees the old man, the old Rav, the old Gdolado, Rav Oyerbach, running. He's literally in his 80s and he's running towards him. Stop, 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 stop. Student, shut what happened? What happened? Comes to the Rav, he goes, Yes, for the Rav, what, what happened? He goes, I, 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 just don't say, don't listen to what I said. I, I'm, I'm changing what I said. Don't read it, the Tehilim, in 30 days. Read it in one week. That's it? Yes, one week. He says, Kvodarav, please teach me. I mean, a month is four weeks. Why is it such a big deal difference to three weeks extra the, the Rav has to run out and stop me as if some, some tragedy happened. Like, what happened? Rav Oyebach discloses something to him that gives us a little perspective about what we're talking about. He says, you see, you have to do tshuva for immorality. Every time you're going to read those tehilim over that month, you're going to know that you did that sin. This is your tikkun. But it'll remind you of the sin. Every single time you think about it, even though you're doing a mitzvah, still there's a spark in your mind that's reminding you of the sin. And that puts you in danger. We cannot afford to put you in danger for a whole month. You have to do this as soon as possible to eliminate the danger. Finish it as soon as possible. To say for a person to finish it in one day, perhaps it's too much because he's learning Torah all day. So one week is all we can afford. You cannot have this on your mind for a whole month. This is the reason why many Chachamim that teach the issues of Tikkun Abrit, especially to Balabatim, regular people, not people that are learning Torah all day, people that have to do Tikkunim for wasting seed, for immorality, su goya, and things like that, they tell them, listen, if you have the ability financially, do it yesterday already. Why? You cannot afford to have this for one extra minute in your life. Not just because of the sin in case you still, you die with some of the sin. No, no, no. Not just because of that. Because rather, if you are still not completely rectified from what you've done, you haven't done complete tshuva, that means a part of it is going to stay in your mind. And any part of it that's still in your mind is a danger. Because it could create new thoughts. New thoughts of perversion. New thoughts of further immorality. New thoughts of bigger sins. And the thoughts of sin are worse than a sin. This is why the miraglim in our week's parasha got punished so severely. They got punished severely because it wasn't just that they had bad intentions, they were selfish, they said evil things, they said things that were heretical, such as that the giants are stronger than God. Those were all terrible. But the biggest and the worst thing they did was causing the masses to complain. That was the worst thing. Why? Because that's causing the masses to sin. How do they do it? Simple. Complaining. They complained. Not just to Moshe and Aaron. They complained in front of everyone. When you complain in front of people, 
you influence them to complain. You give them the thought of complaining. You give them the idea that perhaps they should also complain because they also have some beef with this idea, with this issue, with the circumstances. They also have some other things to complain about. So even though those other things are more significant than what you're complaining about, let's just throw it all in there. And their public complaining caused the public to complain. Hence the reason why, while everybody else got punished for 40 years, and then still not going into Eretz Yisrael, those Meraglim died a strange death right there and then, where their tongues came out of their mouth for the evil tongue that they have connected to their bellies, and literally everyone saw them die in the most horrific way possible, and they have no share of the world to come. Because someone that causes the masses to sin loses their Olam Abba. The other things they did were terrible, but this was this topped it all off. Why? They brought an idea into the nation of Israel. And the thought of sin is worse than the sin. They caused them to think of different things they shouldn't be thinking. Now, with all of that said, done, what's our conclusion? And how does this all connect to our holy teachings of the Ramban? The teachings of Shlomo HaMelech showed us that we have to learn Musar because in order for us to serve Hashem and have Yirat Shemaim, fear of Hashem, we have to learn Musar. The prophet Isaiah tells us that as a result of their mindless behavior, their mindless servitude, their fear of heaven was fake. Their fear of heaven wasn't real because it was just on the exterior, not on the interior. And that's why they honored Hashem with their lips, giving lip service, but their heart was distanced from them. And their fear was, in essence, called out as fake. So here we see that step number one is a person must know that if they don't have fear of Hashem, it'll ultimately lead to no kavana, no intention. And if there's no kavana, we lose wisdom. We hear wisdom, but we don't understand it. And that's in essence what a person needs to take home and realize. Intimacy is not just a physical act for the Jewish people. We're not horses. We're not cattle. For us, it's critical what your mind is about. What are you thinking about? If you're only thinking of your spouse as some piece of meat that is going to relieve you, that means you have no kavana that is connected to Hashem. No kavana that is connected to your spouse. No kavana that's connected to anything good. The difference between you and a horse is literally two legs. And the outcome will be the same though. Because what a person thinks about is what he produces. And that's what the Ramban says here. Know that the Holy One, blessed be He, is the God of knowledge who knows what is in the hearts of men? He established his actions 
in perfect wisdom and he gave to each part of this world's nature its own special power which activates the function with which it has been endowed to keep it without a doubt meaning to preserve it and this ability is only known by experience behold he gave man the power to manifest that which he imagines and this power is also known by way of nature if a person thinks of simply their physical desire only then that's what they'll create instead of creating the next greatest tzaddik, the next greatest tzaddika, a pure neshama of a beautiful person that's going to do good in this world, that's going to be very righteous, that's going to be very wise, that's going to be an extraordinary wife to somebody, an extraordinary husband to somebody, someone that's special, that's an addition to the world, that, that's a, uh, someone that's needed in the world. Instead of producing something like that, instead of producing someone that can become a vessel of the ultimate wisdom of the Torah, a vessel of the ultimate ability to do kindness to people, instead of producing that, you'll produce a little kid, but not a kid like a child kid, kid like a calf, like a cow kid. Why? Because your mind was in the world of animals what you'll produce are little animals because the thoughts are greater than the acts when a person has kavana about good things holy things he's thinking about some sugya that 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 uh, that he just completed before the act he was learning during a day he was thinking about hashem when he was praying he was thinking about hashem when the time comes, it's mikveh night, or it's the night that they're supposed to be together. He's not just thinking about, ah, I need to relieve myself. She's not just thinking, I need to relieve myself. We're not donkeys. We're Jews. And therefore, we have to think. Use that mind of ours. What else does this physical act do? Oh, it's a way to serve Hashem. It's a way to bring beautiful neshamot into the world it's a way to fulfill a mitzvah it's a way to connect our bodies and our neshamot if a person is thinking about holy character traits that the patriarchs had the sages had holy teachings that he's learned during the day and even during that time, he could literally put the, his mind in such a place, in such a focus, that he's thinking of a good character trait. He's thinking of humility. He's thinking of generosity. He's thinking of something that he's really connected to, that's good. Something he learned about, something he values, that's good. During that time, he's thinking of that as well as loving his spouse as well as connecting to his spouse, but he's also in his mind focusing on some amazing thing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gifted him with. He then becomes an artist that is designing his own seed to have those same exact things that he's creating. Literally, that character trait that you want your child to have could be designed in your mind during that time but if you're thinking about pornography if you're thinking about what you're going to eat after if you're thinking about this weekend and the game that's coming up if you're thinking about some impure zona that you saw in the street or in the movies if you're thinking about some movie star or singer that you saw on some tv or on some youtube channel that's what you're thinking about when you're with your, with your husband that's what you're thinking about when you're with your wife guess what you'll have a golden calf coming out of your body not a tzaddik not a neshama of gold because the mind is greater than the act now this affects all of us the way we allow it to affect us you could affect it you could use it 
to a positive way elevate yourself, whether Jew or Gentile, young or old, or you could simply say, ah, it's not for me. And simply sign off the decree on yourself and get the stamp of approval for being part of the cattle. Don't be cattle. Be righteous. And Bezat Hashem will learn more next time. Thank you for learning with me. Hashem bless each and every single one of you to succeed in the most extraordinary ways in all of your spiritual endeavors to get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to sanctify His name and Bezat Hashem to be partners with us, learning together with us, supporting when you can and pushing yourself to the limits because ultimately that's what you can do. We'll learn again tomorrow.